What is going on everybody? Hopefully your new year has started off going good. Today's video, I'm going to call this part two of the reasons why I won't be setting up at a lot of card shows in 2024. There were a lot of responses on the video and I know a lot of people don't scroll through those. I've gotten various text messages, emails, Instagram messages, uh, on this video, and there's just a lot of information on to it, and I get to see from what other people are seeing in other states as well, and you know, you get to see the frustrations and stuff like that with setting up at shows, and in some, there's a lot of, you know, good advice people are putting on there. I know, like I said, a lot of people don't scroll through, read all the comments, and reply to other people's stuff that much. At least I don't see it that much, unless it's like a scam video or something like that there. So I'm going to end up pulling this up, and I'm actually going to a show tomorrow. I'm not setting up. And I'm going to ask a lot of the dealers that I normally do deals with or I buy from, however you want to word that, you know, some of the various questions like, hey, what do you think is like the worst word or phrase that's going around the hobby today type deal? And stuff like that, because I want to start looking at a lot of different pieces to it. And I think eventually it will be going back to one of my very, very old videos. I think it was last year or the year before where I said card shows are going to be dying down. And I hit part of it later on about where Fanatics wants to take over. Or I shouldn't say take over, but wants to start doing their card shows and promoting and everything. But we'll hit some of that into this video here. I will try to keep this under 20 minutes, everybody, um, because I, there will be a part three to this it'll be out next week uh once i come back from the show and then you guys know i'm setting up the following weekend in martinsville indiana um that was a previous uh i guess you could say engagement that i made and i'm gonna keep and everything like that long as the weather holds up all right let me take this down here there we go all right so these are the comments from the video right here and hopefully I do not, like, I don't want anybody to think that, like, I'm using your, your examples and your comments or picking on you or anything. Like, it's not. There, there's a lot of good conversation on to this. And you guys feel free to go back to this video here that we're talking about. If you want to reply to somebody's stuff and get more insight or depth onto it and everything. I will not pull up any of the IG messages and stuff like that just because I didn't take pictures of it and stuff like that, to be honest. So, this here was done by um, Jason here. I typically set up around three times a year and do very well. A few reasons. I like it. It creates an urgency with buyers. If they don't buy the card now, they likely won't see it again since I'm not setting up next week. That was one of the key points that I was trying to drive in the original video. And he summed it up pretty good there. And it also talks about, like he even said too, the different inventory each time. So if I set up at a show, and I'm not talking about bringing kabooms and downtowns unless they're like the very early years where this stuff's hard to find because people probably trashed them and threw them different places. But cards that are very limited out there or they're very low pop count with either PSA, BGS, whatever it may be, to where I could walk four or five local shows and i'm not going to see this card if i do it'd be you know it shock me type deal i would expect to see maybe one or two of them at a show that's hosting you know 200 to 500 tables and stuff like that but he is right it kind of does if that person like if i'm sitting there let me think here Oh, a Sandy Koufax auto, save from Upper Deck Sweet Spot. You guys remember the ones that have the baseball that's kind of cut out and put into the card? An auto like that there, you're probably not going to see at everybody's table in there. Guarantee you probably don't. You might, if you'd be lucky if you see one more. But if I went to Nashville and set up at one of his big shows at house, those 300 plus tables, there might be five or six in the room. But with this here, we're talking mostly about the local shows that house anywhere from 20 to like 60, 70 tables max. And usually you're seeing around 30 dealers in there. And I agree that, you know, if you're holding stuff that's not seen or not even seen in that room, or is it seen between, you know, various other local shows within, say, an hour drive, you know, that they have to know right then and there. This might be the last time I see it for three or four months. 
it does drive that urgency, like he says there, with the buyers. That's kind of one of the things that I was looking at because, you know, if I'm bringing... Ooh, I wish I had my case open right now because I don't want to use, like, LeBron autos and Kobe autos because those, every now and then, you see pop up at shows. But more of the rarer cards, like I was saying, the Kofax Sweet Spots... Um, Stuff like that there, you don't see at every show, including like around where I'm at. I'm not saying every show all over the places like this. You don't see a lot of vintage anymore. The vintage dealers are really dying down when you do see them. Uh, whoever's bought those up from those uh, collections, they're priced pretty high. Will not lie. Uh, let's see here. And the other thing I want to say with these local shows, I know somebody's always going to ask. I mean, I could go anywhere from making five hundred dollars that day to, you know, four to five grand that day in sales. And that, that's just me thinking over the last two or three years. I know that was one of the topics that I was going back and forth in an IG message on. All right, let's see here. The crew collector, he went to less shows this past year in comparison as well. Cutting down expenses played a big part, but some things like inventory mentioned too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of expenses. If you start traveling too far out, you don't want to do get up at like, say the show's three to four hours away. You got to get there at seven. You probably want to get a hotel the night before, depending on how old you are. Us older guys, you know, over the age of 45. More likely, you're probably going to go get a hotel that night before. If it's a multi-day show, you start throwing out in there, plus table costs, food, and everything. It can get expensive over time. And then the traveling along the gas money. I got it's tax write-offs and stuff off of your profit and stuff, but I kind of get this here. Uh... This is something I also see a lot of at the shows. A couple dozen graded cards all starting at $700. Just an expensive table at the uh, shows. And I talk about this with a lot of people come to my table because they ask me where's these cards at. I say I don't bring them. I'll bring a couple cards that are valued over $1,000. Realistically, last year... I probably sold, I'm not going to use the Midwest Monster as an example. Um, from the local shows, I probably would have sold one. I could think of four cards over $1,000. Now, there's been deals over 1000 But as far as, you know, cards over 1000 a lot of times, I was bringing around, this is an example too. Um, I, I had that Immaculate Herbert RPA PSA 10. Time frame, it was like a thirteen, fifteen thousand dollar card. Everybody wanted to see it, you know, touch it and stuff like that. And it was taking away the attention from the people that were wanting to buy cards, you know, for twenty to a hundred dollars versus trying to work with one person on a deal for a bigger card. I, I don't want to bring cards more for a show and tell purpose. But I would rather have cards there that I know are going to sell that day. So hopefully that makes a lot more sense with what I was trying to get at. And where I was talking about some of the other rare things, you guys probably seen one of the cards I do bring to shows because eventually it's going to sell. That um, it's a bigger card. It looks like a box top. Well, they were box toppers. That Barry Bonds auto card It's a PSA 9 uh, auto grade 10. It's the highest grade of any grading company out there. And to me, for what I have in it and everything like that there, I'm just not going to let it, you know, get down to the nitty gritty onto it. To where somebody's like, oh, I need meat and a bone. That's another thing I hate. Oh, I need some more meat and a bone. You need meat and a bone set up and buy that way. <laughs> you know, that's what dealers are uh, trying to, you know, they're paying their money to set up at the show so they can get deals and buy an inventory. And I get it, there's a lot of people just go to shows with their Pelican cases and, you know, want to flip that way and buy from dealers at anywhere from, well, from what I've seen, 50 to 80 percent. All right.
And this this is where Wildcat, Wildcat, you always have the one. This is where I was starting to talk into why pay to set up if you can walk around, buy, sell, and trade your cards without having to. Good point. Um, I think I replied back to you because I know I, I see it, the reply there, but I think I told you that if I was to set up in a bigger show with 250, 300 plus tables, right? I'm going to miss more deals walking around to buy as not having a table than I would having a walk up market, I guess you could say. That's the one time I will use the word market, a walk up market to where people are bringing cars to the table for me to look at and buy. And I really didn't see um, the big picture until last year at the Midwest Monster. And a uh, guy, uh, Colby, he let me come sit behind a table for a while. My back was killing me during that time frame. And I bet you within that hour I sat there, he had at least 12 to 15 people come up wanting to sell cards. And they were all, you know, did one is 70, 80. Some people, you know, way, way overpriced trying to move stuff. But I would say at least half of them understood, hey, this is a dealer. I'm not going to get full price for it. Let me try to get 80% because new eBay sellers are getting you know, hit with 15. And that would be the one time I would say that um, I would want to pay for a table because I would see more cards walking up to the table than I would walking around that are not dealers, just people attending the show. The smaller shows, 100% agree with you. I can't tell you how many times I see people come to shows, there's vacant tables, and guys will take over that table to do deals at. Um, I can't remember what show I was at. This was about two years ago. And I end up sitting down behind a table and I was doing a couple deals with people. And I noticed that there was, after I walked through about, I don't know, at least 10 people didn't show up at that show uh, getting their tables. I went up and found a guy that ran the show and offered to pay him for the table. He told me, no, you don't need to do that. So I feel bad because I basically heisted your table over there and conducted business there. At least let me pay you for the table. He didn't take nothing on to it. I, I want to say that was in... Oh, I'm trying to remember where I was at on that one. It wasn't one of my local ones like Louisville or Lexington offhand. It was out of state. But anyhow, I remember offering because he was sitting there with his wife. And he had two younger kids. And I offered to pay for the use of my, the table during that time frame. Because I knew he wasn't going to sell the table afterwards. But a lot of people will just take those tables over. And eventually, guys who are running shows will end up not having enough dealers coming in there. And they'll stop running shows. I, I've seen it already happening where there's at least one less show a year in my state. At least one. I think two are going to be non-existent this year. So that would be another bad piece to it. But I agree. You could just walk around, buy, sell, and trade your cards without having to. Because there's plenty of dealers out there that are willing to do sell their cards at 80% or do bulk deals at 70 and 60%. I could tell you that countless times walking around and stuff like that there. I've seen it happen. I've, you know, gone to tables, said, hey, if I buy X amount, where would we be at on price onto this? If we could agree on the value, you know, a lot of times I'll throw a number out or something like that. But it all depends on the person, how well I know them and stuff like that. And a lot of times if you're at a table and you're sitting there listening to the other people interact and you're seeing them getting stuff like buying, you know, $2,000 of cards and getting it for $1,500, you could automatically do the math in your head with what you need to be at throwing a price out. But yes, I do agree. I mean, why pay to set up when you can walk around with your cards? Last year, Midwest Monster, I did well walking around selling my cards, but I missed out and it was on five Tiger Woods autos. And depending on where I'd have been set up at, I have no idea. But he at least made it through half the show, I would say, depending on which way he went around. But uh, he ended up selling them. And I remember the Tiger Woods autos were about two grand a piece. 
sold them to a dealer at fourteen hundred piece. A dealer wanted, I think it was seventeen fifty to eighteen hundred, depending on which one it was, a piece onto it. But you, you'd miss stuff like that, I think, at the bigger shows. All right, moving on here. There's just a couple more comments on here I want to really highlight and not try to keep this to. Oh, we're getting close to twenty. This one here from Adam. He's in Michigan. Uh, been going to shows, also setting up for 20 years. Big problem is that there's too many shows and shows that go on the same weekend as nearby shows. 100% agree. I can tell you just from talking to people that run shows, promote shows out here, the smaller ones, they're like, oh, well, these two shows are going on. Part of the dealers went here or there. When you know that if you gathered up all your dealers and you could probably, that would come to your show without trying to market out to other states and you're only going to get about half of them because other shows are going on and you got to plan your shows around other ones, that's going to be an issue. And yeah, there, there are too many shows. And again, when you start going to those shows, I'd be fine if there was a big overturn of inventory Adam, that people would have different stuff at their tables. Otherwise, I'm walking by, see the same things, and usually I say, hey, how's it going? Everything like anything new here? Yeah, no, no, still same stuff from last week or last two weeks, three weeks, stuff like that there. So it, kind of, it starts turning to be, to me, as a turnoff. Uh, another guy who sets up, been doing it for a few years, he's done after May. That was James. Let me see here. <laughs> the lowest question. <laughs> oh, that, that's just one it's going to take forever to talk about. Oh. This is another part, and this will go into, if I, once I find the guy's question, I think the problem is that people think I pay you 80% in cash, and then they assume you are like them, don't report it to the basically both federal and state so that's 100 percent correct when i price a card and if i let me see if i can scroll down and find this guy's comment because this is going to go or or lady this person's comment right here so word seven two three this is going to go partly to what i was trying to explain here where he said what is your lowest price is a fair question i don't really agree that it's a fair question at all because I'm there already as a seller. I have a sell, I have a price tag on my card. I know some people won't agree with me onto this, but when you come up and go, what's the lowest you'll take or what will you really take for this? That to me just irks me like, okay, no, because you're just looking to have AKA meat on the bone onto the whole situation because you're going to resell it. If I was sitting there with a ton of, I don't know, Silver Prism, Silver Selects, and all these retail hits that you see across the board and stuff. Yeah, I probably wouldn't really be, I would probably not care. I'd probably throw out what my lowest I would take on, especially if I bought it, low graded it, and I'm only in the card for 40%. Hey, I'll take 80% onto it then, you know. But when I look at it with the stuff that I, takes me time to find, track down, or people hit me up and say, hey, would you be interested in these? I'm, you know, selling off my collection and stuff, and there's some stuff I don't see very often. Then that's where I'm like, no. But I know you said, okay, there are sales tactics, and there are definitely buyer's tactics. If I come to your table and I tell you that I have a card I'm going to buy, narrow it down to two cards... The card I want from you and another from another dealer was the best you could do on said card. Now, I know this is a very open-ended question. Um, first, you know, depending on the card, it really would be off the bat. It would also depend what I, have you bought from me in the past, you know. But where I'm going to just use that because I never met you before. It's the first time you come to the show. That's what you tell me and everything like that. The first thing that goes to my mind, say you were offering on a card that's stickered at 500 and I know there's sales between 490 and 520 on it all across the board. My eBay is at 11%. Most people are 14, 15% if they've been, you know, brand new eBay users. They don't have a store, yada, yada, yada. They don't have top seller and all that stuff, right? So... 
If I take that card at five, oh, I actually I used 300 in my example. Okay, we'll go with 300. I would clear around $267 from eBay for that, right? If I have somebody coming up to me like, oh man, I want to get it at 240, I'm already cutting myself short. Because if I take cash, and this goes with the IRS piece on to it, not reporting it to state and federals, you know, hey, somebody might do that that doesn't record all their sales, which, you know, you can get in some trouble for if you get caught onto that stuff. But if I sold it at 80%, I'm still losing another 6% that I have to cover in sales tax. So realistically, I'm down 26% onto the card. Shouldn't I just stick to just selling it online and getting the money that way? You know, that kind of stuff there is where I look at it as, you know, because I'm cutting into my profits by always giving out big deals to people, every single person coming back. I know in return, that person may never come back and buy from me again. But from doing this for a very, very long time, it's the first time I've ever seen them in a show, and I've been doing shows for five, six years you know, currently, probably since 2018, 17, 18, somewhere around there. After it was a couple of years after I retired, um, I might not ever see that person again. Anyhow, out there, you know, that's the way I have to look at it. I would rather do that to somebody who's always buying from me, and just like when I was a breaker, you know, guys who were always. Buying six, seven teams a break, four teams here, maybe five, maybe three here. You try to always cut somebody some, you know, some, uh, I guess, I don't want to say slack, but some of the price off because you want to do something nice for people that are always returned, customers on to it. But that's where I was trying to get with what I was trying to explain there is that to me, I take it personal in a way. When somebody comes up, they would say, hey, how you doing? What's the lowest you'll do on this? Or what can you really do on this? And normally, I will tell you now that it's between the ages of 16 and probably 28, 29 years old, maybe even 30. And I'm just like, wow, you know, that sticker's on it. Feel free to make an offer. That's usually what I come up and say. As soon as I, they start off at like 240, well, you won't do 240? No. And I can explain to them why I'm at a certain price on to because I include sales tax, you don't have to pay shipping on to it, and you get the card right here now. And then this is not a common card you're going to see at 60 to 70 percent of these tables out here today. You may not see this if you drive around to the next three local shows that are within the state or just outside the border of Indiana. And you know, I get the same people come up to me, this is no joke. Time after time again, I always want to get stuff on a down low or they'll look and be like, oh, well, last sale was this. Well, if you look at the four previous, here are the sales. If you look at this auction here, it went off at like some obscure time where there's not going to be eyes on it. Heck, there could be all kinds of reasons why it went that low onto it. I would be a buyer at all day at that price too, especially whenever the last three say were at, 300 and a guy got it for 240. I'd be a buyer 240 on to it, you know. I I say hey, that's good. Somebody got it cheap out there. Maybe I'm looking at it completely wrong. You guys can tell me as always in the video. But it's still not going to change the overall perspective of setting up less this year at shows. And it's not just because of People coming up wanting to lowball all the time and that there. It's just not that for the reason. There's a lot of time and effort to go into, at least into my part, into packing up, getting everything ready the night, day before, night of, driving there, tear down, come home, do everything again. But I got it. It's my choice. It's my choice that I want to sell at shows. But if I can eliminate doing that, and I'm making more money even per eBay, ComC, my slabs, saying it to DC Sports, Probstein, Golden, whatever it may be. To me, it would behoove me to seek max value onto the card, where and however I can off bat. Even Facebook. You all know what razzes are. Heck, half people I could razz half the cards and you know get more out of it. Even taking PayPal goods and services. So, to me, I look at it as 
can I get more money elsewhere? Or has this person ever done a deal with me before? Knowing, I know, it's going to be in the comments, you're probably going to lose that person ever from buying from you again. I might. I might. That's the risk that I personally take by saying I can't do it that low. It is. But then again, I know how long I search and look and try to find cards that you don't see at every table to show to put in my display cases. And I would buy them all day again at 70 to 80% what people are offering on to it. But guys, I know I've gone over 20, I'm over 25 minutes. I do apologize. I wanted to keep it at 20. I got a little winded on to this here. But I wanted to try to go into some of the comments on to this. And try to get a little bit further of an explanation. Because if I didn't explain it good enough into my reply on there to you. Because I know when you read stuff, it's a lot different than hearing somebody saying it. I, it's just one of the ways it is. Like, I was always better at watching somebody do something to learn how to do it. Than looking at a book and following the diagrams type deal. And reading, you know, the steps along the way. Other people might be vice versa. I don't know. But I at least wanted to come on here and hit some of the questions or some of the comments, guys. I do appreciate everybody's comments on to the video. I really wasn't expecting to get this much um, in responses to it at all. This was just one of those off the wing videos where I wanted to talk about some of the stuff I've seen. And as with all with everybody hitting me up, I'm gonna probably make I don't want to be making weekly videos or stuff on this, but it'll probably be you know, a bigger series up into the monst Midwest Monster just to see how things change throughout time. I'll probably, like I said, I'll do one after this next show um, that I'm going to. Well, actually, it's tomorrow. I, I think I'm posting this actually Friday night. And then also after I set up at the first show of the year, because there won't be a second show probably until April time frame, maybe May. And then it's right to the Midwest Monster uh, for, you know, the bigger show of the year. And then we'll, I'll probably re, I don't want to say reinvestigate, but talk again about, you know, some of the experiences, seeing how things change. Is it changing my opinion on to wanting to set up more or not? Or just, you know, is it easier to just put it online and go that way with it? I know by selling online, you miss that interaction you have with people to communicate face-to-face. -face. And that, to me, is one of the biggest things I like to have, is being able to go, you know, face-to-face -face or on a phone call or whatever it may be, Zoom, versus, you know, just selling to anybody out there that sees what I have. You know, whether it's on ComC, eBay, MySlabs, DC, on consign, whatever it may be, you know. But hopefully you guys um, liked the video. It was a little bit something different that I wanted to talk about. And if I mentioned it in here, it was nothing like I'm trying to shotgun blast anybody onto it. There was a lot of people that shared some of the similar things that I've been seeing onto it. And even like here where Mark said, go to card shows, no deals, they're cheaper online. I 100% agree that I've been finding better deals online than I do at shows. At shows, I can visually see the card if I want to start looking at sending in a PSA order, which is an added benefit to it. So I might have to pony up a couple more dollars, but in return, I get to see the condition of the card up front. But I do agree there are better deals online. You can find cards that are graded at better deals before. And then just one last one I want to touch before I call this video, JB Hats. Um, first time watcher and everything on here. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate you watching it and everything, like the video on to it and everything. But yeah, the eBay store has always been good to me. There's, like you said, on to it, there's a lot of guys that are looking for the flip for whatnot and whatever it may be out there. And again, there are some repackers out there. I know a lot of them, people don't like the word repacker for repack products. But there are some out there that are truly will buy at 90%. <laughs> and when I say at 90, that's like, I wish I had some cards in front of me. Some of my, what I would call mid-end cards and a lot of the bigger cards, they'll give me full price songs. It's a chase card. And then all I'm up to have to worry about is a 6% sales tax instead of 11% on eBay. 
So they're not all bad out there. There are a few that I do uh, work with quite frequently in selling stuff onto it. Uh, there were more on to here. I just don't want to keep uh, clicking through everybody's stuff and making this into an hour video. Again, everybody, thank you very much for all the interactions on the previous video of why I won't be setting up a lot of card shows in 2024. This was part two. Just wanted to go over some of the comments that you guys left, some of the uh, questions that I've received that were, might not have been worded exactly the same, but the end statement was still the same across the board onto it. So hopefully the video helped me explain that a little bit better than if I wrote you a big paragraph and it was kind of like a run on and like, huh, what's he mean by all this? So hopefully that hel uh, helps explain a little bit better. But all right, everybody, I appreciate your time watching the videos as always. I will be back with another video um, with the card show. Should be the next one up. I think we're going to be talking a little bit about the Fanatics card shows that they want to do and whether or not that's going to be a good or bad idea by them. All right, everybody, take care. Have a good weekend. I'm out.